Thanks, Tim, for uh, the introduction. Um, we heard a lot about tropical pathology the last three days, and I was thinking, what could I add in those uh, on, on this? Um, I'm taking the perspective of a flight surgeon working in a, a transport wing. It means I'm working in a, the 50, I'm working for the 15th wing transport in Melsbrook, and uh, I took out three stories to tell you. Those three stories, what they have in common is that those tropical related diseases will all occurred with uh, aircrew. And those aircrew are still flying at this moment. So somewhere in the revalidation process of this um, flying crew, there was a decision about fitness to fly. And that I want to stress on, on, on that. I was asked to prepare a question as well, so I did. Please, please read and fill it up. Remark, I didn't specify that it was Jack Daniels or other whiskey, Scottish whiskey. So the majority went for solution three. Okay, we will see. Um, I just want to introduce uh, the 15 transport, uh, air transport wing, what they are doing and what kind of fleet they have. And then I got three cases, you seeing the names alone. Loa Loa is a very um, challenging name, so I will explain a little bit about that. A malaria and an HIV positive um, uh, case. And then I was asked to introduce the next speaker, which is Dr. Patel. So I will uh, give some uh, explanation about the position of Belgium when we have to transport a patient of, with hemorrhagic fever. Yeah, the credits, uh, I got the permission of the, the patients themselves to, to tell their story here before you. And I got the pictures from them as well, so they use those pictures. And I got a lot of help from the Center of Aviation Medicine in our military hospital and for the, from the travel clinic, uh, which is our tropical uh, specialist. Um, something about the 15 transport wing. This is a normal transport wing, the only one in Belgium. It's a small country with a small air force. You see it's, a, it's organized in a typical way, a flying group with two flying squadrons, maintenance group and a support group. Uh, what is maybe a little bit particular is that the medical detachment um, is uh, completely independent of the base commander. So it means that uh, we have a central uh, medical command and my boss is uh, somebody from the central medical command and not the base commander, which, which has its advantages, but also its disadvantages. We are located uh, in the national uh, airport of Brussels, Zaventem. It's about 10 kilometers northeast of the center of Brussels and we get a small port uh, over there in the corner. The fleet, um, the backbone of the uh, 15 transport wing are the 11 C-130s. You're seeing we have the H model, so they're dating of, uh, from the 70s, and they will be replaced by I A A400M, uh, in, uh, I think it's planned in 2019. And then we got some wide bodies, um, Falcons, Embraers, and an Airbus A330. To scope, uh, to getting more to the the subject of this uh, briefing. Um, I just uh, make clear how many overnights uh, the C-130 crews have done the last year. As you can see, um, the number, so we have about 130, 120 uh, air crew members of C-130, and the average of uh, overnights is about 36 uh, a year. So they did have some exposure to tropical conditions. Um, one of our tasks the last three years, there is a Belgian C-130 on a permanent base in uh, Kisangani, it's in uh, Congo. 
and uh, they're flying their missions for the the UNO missions there over there. So I'm flying around in Eastern Congo. There are monthly rotations, about 30 people who are uh, on a permanent basis in, um, in uh, Kisangani. And from end of January, we supported the, 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 the operation of the French in Mali as well. And there are two C-130s uh, now stationed in Abidjan, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, where they're doing the missions for the, the Mali Ops. So you can imagine that there as well is a detachment of 30 people. Uh, we got some people in the tropics. Um, more uh, in detail for uh, the patients I will discuss. Um, Kisangani, maybe you all have uh, read the novel of um, John Conrad, It's the Heart of Darkness. It's really the, the middle of, uh, of Congo. There they are situated there. Um, the other um, names who will pop up are Bukavu in Eastern Congo and Kinshasa. Yeah, we, we've seen this slide as well. The risk calculation is about 500 times more to getting in contact with parasites in Africa than in Europe. Yeah, first case is um, the Loa Loa case. Um, this is uh, the story of a flight engineer uh, who was on a long time mission in Congo, about six weeks. And uh, he was being bitten by a chrysops fly. This is the retrospective view. Uh, uh, probably in the Bukavu area and probably one week till two weeks after it's not clear when he was being clearly bitten um, he developed in uh, Kinshasa uh, a swelling at the left maxillary side the swelling was shifting itching red and swollen warm colored he had stable vital signs there was no fever and he was seen by a local doctor this was a crew who was flying isolated without any medical support. So they go to see a local doctor in Kinshasa. They put him under antibiotics. Like he was under training, there was another flight engineer on that mission and they could continue the mission. To, they could return back home as uh, the patient was uh, a UT. He was only C, uh, was returning as a passenger in the C-130. They did an overnight in Cotonou. It's in uh, Benin. It's in West Africa. And there, an ultrasound in a lab was done. I've seen the result of the lab. There was nothing particular in. So the white blood cell count was normal. There was a little shift of the formula, but the eosinophilic um, number was not increased. The ultrasound, I will show you a picture about the ultrasound later. He came back in, uh, in Belgium and he was seen in the travel clinic. And there, based upon the clinical um, view, as well as the serology, they made the diagnosis of filariasis. They started the treatment. Treatment is a parasitic, anti-parasitic treatment, ivermectin, and some uh, symptomatic treatment as well, corticoids and non-steroidal -steroidal, anti-inflammatory drugs. I will not go into detail further, but what you will see is that this patient is doing some kind of recidive of complaints afterwards. And those swellings are not only in the, in the fa not only facial swellings, but they will move and shift as well to the upper arm and to his legs. And different types of treatment are um, uh, tried. So they tried evermectin, the the um, diethylcarbamazine, and a little bit later they even went further to albendazole. So if you read in the literature that, that the three treatments are really prescribed for uh, filariasis. Um, what is uh, remarkable in this, this story is that this gentleman was not grounded. He was only grounded when he, after an episode, after five months, that he had more general symptoms like fever and fatigue. And then at that moment he had an episode of uh, really uh, itchy, uh, itching uh, swellings on different locations. With the tropical specialist, uh, apparently there was another approach, uh, therapeutic approach discussed, and uh, preventive treatment uh, of every three months was installed, with also an acute treatment. When he got symptoms, an acute treatment was um, prescribed. And as you can see, um, the last episode of really itchy swelling, he had that, uh, I think, a couple of months ago in, in November, 
and uh, he was reporting again some itching swelling and it was still related to the Loa Loa disease. And that's five years after the start of the whole story. That's the story. I will go a little bit into detail. This is nice to see. This was the, the, the ultrasound in uh, Cotonou and you can see the snake-like figure who was really in the zygoma. This is really the parasite crawling around in the subcutaneous tissue and, sh and responsible for the swellings. These were the pictures of the, the patient himself. He took himself the first pictures and as you can see there was only about one hour of difference between those two pictures. So you can see that it's really shifting from shifting swellings in the left maxillary side. Further pictures. Um, this picture is taken, I think, five weeks after the initial symptoms. And there you can clearly see the swelling of the upper lip. And when you see in this clinical image, you would think that's an angioedema. And the angioedema, it is an angioedema. There is some allergic reaction on the parasite, and that's the, the giving the symptoms. This is not a picture from, I got from the, from the patient, but uh, I, I found it in the, in the Journal of uh, Medicine, in the Dutch uh, Journal of Medicine. What is typical for Loa Loa is those calabar swellings. And I don't know if the, the quality of the picture allows it to you to see, but the right hand here, you can see there is less signs than on, 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 the, on the left hand. So there is discrete swellings to see. And mostly they are complaining about an itchy feeling as well. That's what he's selling at this moment. Um, some episodes of itchy swellings in his arms. And what he's, do what he's doing at this moment, he just take uh, two or three days, some corticoids, it's going away. It's controlling the angioedemic reaction and then it's, it's gone away. So the calabar swellings are clearly angioedema mostly allergic driven. Um, it's caused by the female chrysops fly who, will, who has been uh, bitten, who, who has been, who, I don't know, I'm struggling with my English here, but um, he, who bites the, the patients. And it's well known in uh, Cameroon and by extension uh, in uh, northern and eastern Congo as well. Um, Normally, it's migrating in the subcutaneous um, tissue, giving also the immune response. But as you will see in the picture, it's well known as well as the eye worm. Uh, it's uh, m sometimes m migrating in the subconjunctiva as well. It's the, the speed is one centimeter a minute. You can imagine that it is itching. Uh, the worm itself can live up to 17 years. So if there is no antiparasitic treatment given, it can live very long. It's not a deadly disease, but it's a harmful disease. Western visitors, they don't have any antibody, antibodies and they have a performant immune system. So their, their reaction of the acalabar swellings will be heavier. Yeah, this is uh, what I got from the CDC. Uh, what is being the, the whole cyclus is that the fly will give you some larvae, introduce it in um, the, the body and into, into the body they will fast develop the adult forms of the worm. Those adult forms of the worm will mo mostly uh, stay in the subcutaneous tissue but sometimes it is going into the eyes. And there is, uh, if you see on the internet, you can see films where they take out the, the, the worm out of the eye of patients, very spectacular movies to, to show, to see. Um, in, in the in human body, they're giving some uh, microfilaria, some eggs, and those eggs are again taken up by the fly, and the fly, in the fly, there is a, another uh, cyclus of the eggs further development to uh, the larvae who will then be injected. Um, Calabar, where it's, com com where it's coming from, it's uh, uh, named after a place in Nigeria, close to the Cameroon border. And Loa Loa, what does that mean? That's uh, uh, African uh, eye worm is the indigenous uh, name of it. The disease itself is not Loa Loa. Loa Loa is the name of the parasite. And um, the, the disease is uh, had some uh, difficult pronounceable names 
I will not try it. Yeah, fitness to fly. This is a case. Um, I have to say, I, maybe I, it comes over that I am looking for excuses, but at that time, um, the, the patient was not uh, grounded at the initial complaints. Something uh, was happening at that time. He was re really in his final stage of training. So he's a flight engineer in his final stage, and he didn't want himself that the, he would be grounded at the final stage. He will be l losing a lot of time after uh, other ways. And the travel clinic itself, the tropical specialist who was treating him in the first way, was not fully aware about the regulations of using medication in air crew. So um, the, the cooperation uh, could have been, uh, been better at that, at that moment. So he was only being grounded when he was graduated, in, uh, and then he got an episode when he got more general science. Then he was grounded and again uh, being put it, um, on, uh, on, uh, on flying status after being seen by a board in the Center of Aviation Medicine. Um, but however, after he was been uh, r r again on flying status, he did some kind of recidives, some itchy uh, swellings again, who are not at all related to the worm who's still crawling around in his body. I think he got enough of antiparasitic medication, but probably due to the depot, who was being left by that, those worms, where there some time to times are some allergic reactions and who can control it with uh, symptomatic treatment easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lessons learned for us. Um, I have to say this was a spectacular case in the squadron. You don't, it's a small world. Those pictures have been gone to the whole uh, squadron. And it increased really the awareness of tropical pathology. They realized that they are really at risk. Uh, I mentioned already the underreporting. Um, we increased the cooperation and that's been installed right now between the travel clinic and the center of aviation medicine. And another issue, another excuse I could use is we in Belgium have a really dramatic uh, number of uh, military flight surgeons and a close follow up of our um, uh, air crew at this moment. I think we are not able to realize at this moment. And maybe we could use this case to discuss it to our higher levels that we need some more flight surgeons there. Okay. Second case is a, a malaria case. It's a, ra a rather simple case, but I will open. I will use this case to discuss the malaria prophylaxis. This was a flight engineer uh, returning after seven days after returning from a mission, Monusco. Um, he had some typical symptoms: muscle pain, feverish, uh, since 24 hours, with some night sweating, and some his temperature was not that high but he was taking some aspirin he didn't take any chemoprophylaxis for five weeks mission in Congo in Kisangani yeah okay then uh, on his lap you see that he was lucky that his um, parasite load was not that high he was really sick he slept a lot um, uh, he's been treated classically by oral treatment he didn't vomit or, or anything else so we could do it with uh, the Riamet which is the, the combination of lumifantrine and artemeter. The only thing what uh, really bothering that in the serology there was uh, some titers for falciparum, what we usually should expect in, uh, uh, in Congo, but there also was probably a mixed infection with uh, falciparum uh, ovalum, um, plasmodium ovale. And ovale, this is what uh, also give, can give you the hypnozoids, which could give you relapses of malaria uh, um, for a long time. And then you have to make a decision, was this only a cross-reaction or was it a real mixed infection? And we discussed that with the tropical specialist and he said mostly it would be a cross-reaction and we didn't treat him uh, for uh, Plasmodium ovale um, with uh, Primakin. He was grounded um, uh, since the beginning of the symptoms, only one week after mission, so he, had, uh, he was ungrounded after his symptoms started. He had a rest for 20 cents, 26 days and he was returning to flying status after 29 days after being seen by the medical board of our uh, aviation medicine center. So the monitoring for the mixed infection is still in our back of our head when we see this guy with, uh, with a fever. Uh, it could be that he is doing a relapse of the, of the ovale, but the, the, the risk for it is uh, very low. So. Uh, I will ex expand a little bit what is the malaria prophylaxis officially in the 15th transport wing. These are the slides we are using for the aircrew. So it is A, B, C, D. It's rather simple. 
awareness, anti-bite measures, hemoprophylaxis, and early diagnosis and treatment. I think in this case of malaria, uh, step uh, one, two, and four has worked very well. He was uh, rather quickly sent to the the center, uh, the, tra the travel clinic where they took the, the tick smear and the diagnosis was uh, uh, not, uh, has not been awaited for long and he was treated as well very fastly. But the discussion is the hemoprophylaxis. What is the official statement for us in our, in our wing is that for short missions for three days we don't give any medication. Um, we only giving anti-bite measures as advice. Uh, when we're going for longer missions than three days, we really give uh, chemoprophylaxis and the standard products, I think like uh, everyone else, is used or malarone or doxycycline. Uh, as emergency treatment, uh, we have foreseen or malarone uh, taking uh, four tablets a day for three days. Um, or the other one is Riamet, um, which uh, you have to take six uh, six times four tablets with some uh, risks on, on it but uh, um, what we have foreseen is that the malarone and the riamet are in the um, first aid bags for crew in the c-130 so if they go isolated in africa they have the medication with them we advise them to go to a local doctor and at least have a proper diagnosis if that is not possible contact the tropical specialist and giving those medication they get in their first aid bags uh, conclusion is that um, we had a, a tryout between 2006 and 2008 that there was no chemoprophylaxis uh, given for our frequent Africa flyers. Uh, it was not a success. We had three serious cerebral malaria cases. So three serious malaria cases. Um, so we did change our policy again, but apparently not all the crew have already in their mind that uh, the policy has been changed. Now, what I found out as a flight surgeon of the, the transport wing is the best way to convince them that um, they should take care uh, about anti-malaria me measurement is the getting a testimony by, the, by those three guys who get the cerebral malaria. I can explain a lot about medical issues. I, if I let it explain by those case guys who had the cerebral malaria, it's getting much more impact. And that's what I'm doing at this moment. All the malaria cases I got, and I got three till five a year, I let them, uh, sent them an all air crew mail explaining them how they dealt with the situation. Um, and what is working, an argument is what is working very well in aircrew is that you can tell that they get a one month grounding for an avoidable pathology. Then uh, they get, they are more sensible that, to that argument than to other ones. Okay, last story is an HIV positive case. Uh, it happened in Kinshasa and Cotonou, you will see why. This is a loadmaster steward who was on a routine blood sample HIV positive with also a chlamydia positive serology. The rest of the sexual transmitted diseases were uh, negative. He had the story that he'd been divorced and had a girlfriend in uh, Kinshasa and in Cotonou at the same time. Um, and uh, he had unprotected sex with, uh, with uh, those two girlfriends. When the diagnosis of seroconversion was uh, uh, confirmed, it was impossible to trace those girlfriends. You see, in the first initial uh, blood count, the CD4 is not that low. Um, and uh, the viral load was uh, neither that high. He was being treated for uh, chlamydia, and um, after five months, they decided, uh, with the advice of the tropical specialist, to put him on antiretroviral therapy because he had twice CD4 counts lower than 350, which is apparently the trigger point for starting those uh, therapy. He was put it on a triple therapy, um, and. Uh, he had no uh, major side effects of this uh, triple therapy. There was some transient rash and uh, dizziness complaints, um, but uh, uh, he tolerated very well. After checkups, every three, four months, he got a complete blood sample there. Uh, there was nothing more reported. We put him on the pneumococcin vaccination. And as you can see, he had extreme low viral loads and he was not very intelligent. You can happen. I was not very happy to hear it as well. He had a Thai girlfriend, and then he get a, a new fathership of an HIV-negative son. 
Okay, you can imagine what kind of uh, people we have there. Um, fitness to fly. So we did our best to put him uh, to keep him in uh, in um, in uh, flying status. He was first grounded for three months for psychological uh, reasons and after uh, being put on the uh, retroviral therapy he was put it on the ground for the side effects of that uh, uh, retroviral therapy um, and then uh, he was uh, restricted in time not in, um, in geo geographic uh, limitation and put it on a strict con uh, condition of a close medical follow-up um, and uh, he was prolonged every four months uh, to uh, continue with his job. And now after two years, they put him on uh, six months. So conclusions, HIV positive, it's not excluding flying duty. Uh, we need a close follow-up uh, uh, for, for those cases. I have to tell you, this is the only case I got, f I'm aware of in the transport world. I'm not of that there is in the fighter wings any case, but I adopted it will be, the, I think it's really our only HIV positive case in air crew we have in Belgium. And I did uh, my best to get some sexual transmitted disease campaign in uh, the 15 transport wing as well. Okay, these were my three stories I wanted to share with you. Uh, just to introduce the next speaker, uh, I was asked to give the position about what we do with hemorrhagic fever. As you can see, it's in the same location. Belgium had um, an uh, ATI, air transportable isolator, um, in the 90s. However, since 2007, we have no team and uh, no longer update of this uh, equipment. So what is our actual attitude? If available, have the patient treated in a local me medical treatment facility. Otherwise, transport the patient when he is not infectious anymore, send a specialist team or call for international help. And that's really the introduction for the next speaker, I think. Questions will come. You have the occasion later, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. There you go. Good educator. Thank you very much.